So we're back with the official U.S. PlayStation Magazine demo disc number 69. Did the playground in the previous episode. We're going to go inside the game. Hunter the Reckoning Wayward. What is this about? Summer, the hunt is on as Interplay Entertainment and High Voltage Software bring White Wolf's popular pen and paper game, Hunter the Reckoning, to the PlayStation 2 computer entertainment system. Touting a brand new story available only on the PlayStation 2, Hunter the Reckoning Wayward exposes the horror of the world of darkness like never before. And now, we take you behind the scenes to hear directly from the creators of the Runaway franchise. Wayward is a action game where you and a buddy get together and you just kill monsters, do side quests. This game, although I don't remember if I ever played it or not, the name always sort of screwed me up because I would always it would always appear in my head as Hunter the Reckoning or the the Wayward Reckoning instead of the Reckoning Wayward. Don't know why. I don't know why I remember this game if I didn't play it. God, that girl was tiny, wasn't she? I'm going to end up looking this game up. Working with the White Wolf license, I played Vampire when it first came out. I got one of the first copies of uh, Hunter the Reckoning. To, to work on a white Tabletop. Okay. The Reckoning Wayward. PlayStation 2. Published 2003. Reception. Uh, mixed or average reviews. Fantastic. They realize that there's a uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. And someone is actually pulling the cult strings, so they call in the help and assistance of the first four. Uh, visuals dull or dark. Once those four hunters arrive, heeding this call, they find that hmm. the two original hunters are, have vanished in the 68 out of 100 on Metacritic. They set out to uncover what happened to them, find out what Game Informer get it a 6.25 out of 10. Game Pro, three and a half stars. Game Spot, seven out of 10. Game Spy, four out of five. Game Zone, 8.3 out of 10. IGN, 8.2 out of 10. Martial arts very quick. It's listed as a horror game. He's a priest. Well, I mean, I see some horror imagery, but it's not really a horror game. It doesn't look like much of one. Who is the ex cop? She's fast. She has a fairly good weapon. Pretty good use of magic. And then there's the new guy. High voltage software. What did they do? Who is the psychopath? Oh shit. Lego racers and coming soon. Part two of the making of Jaguar Games. Some zombie land game. Oh, the Windows Portal, Mortal Kombat 10. Okay. Amazing Spider-Man 2 on uh, the 3DS. Remaster of some Saints Row game. Uh, they worked on the Zone of the Enders HD ports. Uh, whatever. Moving on. Looking up the damn uh, developer of... This is going to be a short video, isn't it? Hi, my name is Saul Villegas. And today I'm going to show you a cool move for the game... The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. In this cool move, I'm going to show you how to defeat Lurtz, who is the boss at the end of the level, Amin Hen. Let me show you how it's done. For the first part of this battle, what you want to do is... Oh, was this a Lord of the Rings game? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> you won't be able to attack him with your sword yet. I remember when I first... Uh, I did not get into PC gaming until later on. I think this is a different game that I'm thinking of, but I didn't get in the PC gaming until um, after I was out of high school, because I couldn't afford one. I had to get a job, you know. Eventually, it'll move on to phase two. And I got this piece of shit PC from Best Buy, and I started buying these games for it, but I didn't know I had a piece of shit PC. 
and it ran most games out there, just not but well, you know. Drop your resolution, drop your graphics options, hey, you got your game. But what was possibly the first game that I actually purchased for it was a Lord of the Rings game, which I stumbled across it while doing some house cleaning not too long ago. Actually, it was about a year ago. Not too long ago. It was a while ago. And it was garbage. <laughs> Once again, I don't know if I ever actually played a good Lord of the Rings game. Oh Lord shit! You know, no, I made that. I made that up. Uh, what was, what was the one where, th the orcs and you're fighting them in your Shadows of Mordor. And then there was Shadows of War that came after it, which I guess was a better game, but it didn't have any. Um, it didn't evolve the format quite enough, so it didn't have the same splash. And you'll be able to defeat but for the most part, these Lord of the Rings games, they sucked. I'm sorry, Saul, I didn't listen to any of your trip chips. Good luck and have fun. Devil May Cry 2, this is an unfortunate one. Hi, I'm Linnea Lydon, and in today's cool move, I'll be showing you how to improve your style ranking in Devil May Cry 2. Here's how it's done. Streaming at the screen since 95. <laughs> Alright, so Devil May Cry 2. My god, that game is a disappointment. I really like... I mean, I, I consider myself a fan of the Devil May Cry series. But honestly, the only one that I'm a real fan of is the original. Because I just sort of... I heard that the second game wasn't very good, and then the third game was good again. But when I got the third game, it just... it didn't speak to me the way that the original did. Like, I get that it was a... like, it, it evolved the formula, it just wasn't... just wasn't for me anymore. I mean, uh, but years later, it was years later that I decided to give Devil May Cry 2 a shot. And honestly, I got like two hours into it. And it was just so dull. Dante was like just standing around. The, the environment design was so plain and was so lifeless compared to what you saw in the first one or the third one. And it was like, oh god, this is such a, a paint by numbers sequel that they forgot half their paint colors and hey how's it going what was I'm this Alex game cyber cyber protector jump on hypersonic extreme to help you win the race hypersonic extreme is this like a wipeout right, the key to this game is to listen at the start don't watch the timer just listen for the chime right at the beginning yeah it's like a wipeout You hit the gas when you hear the chime after Look the at that. Run, you're good to go. Are there any wipeout games the anymore? Finishes, you'll hear that chime mash on the X I know button, was it Cygnosis that did wipeout in front of all your competitors and you'll be on your way to it. And it was a it was an interesting time because Cygnosis did wipe out and Sony bought Cygnosis but didn't exert that much control over them. So they released wipeout on like the Saturn and Windows PC. Hey, how's it going? Rayman. I'm and today I'm going to show you how to beat up on the last boss of Rayman 3. I know people like Rayman. And, like, it's it's something, I guess. Chain power up. Run I'm, back towards him, target his shield. Just not my, uh... Shoot the chain and start mashing on the... Not my cup of tea. ...to electrocute him while moving back and forth to dodge his fireball. When his shield's gone... Then again, I guess it's a very different up. Rayman than, like, the more target recent him. ones. Throw some knockout punches. Or the original. It's kind of 3 dification so of that chain power up, of um, old school platformers. Watch out for the little yellow circles on the A lot of them didn't make the transition that well. Avoid them. Once you get the chain power up, run over, shoot his shield, and electrocute him. By Dude looks like he's on quaaludes. Button. Then grab the other power up and throw some knockout punches. Reflux will be down for the count. All right. Uh, did I already do this one? <laughs> oh shit! This is just a file. Save. This is another save. Save. 
All right, so we're done with this. Extras and there's nothing here. Oh, uh, what do we got here? I didn't see what it was I clicked on. Didn't see what I clicked on. Okay, be honest. How many times have you played a game and thought, I could make a better game than this? Over the next few issues, we're going to take a look at the process of game design and talk about how designers make games and the skills that they use. You'll get a better understanding of the work that goes into your favorite games. And I think I saw one of these episodes if you decide to earlier. Make for that better game your career. Now, for all you hands-on gamers out there, a company called H-Tech has created their game designer series that lets you start to build your own games at home using your PlayStation 2. Fighter Maker. Launched the designer series in year 2000 for PS1. This year, 2002, we've just launched Fighter Maker 2 for PS2. Next year in 2003, we have Color Quest and RPG Maker 2. All of them exclusively for PS2. The one thing that they all have in common is the more the player puts into any of Okay, them, so RPG the Maker was something I had bought for the PlayStation for 1. And I spent so much time toying around with that. I loved that. It was very simple. You couldn't do a whole hell of a lot with it because you had to save everything onto a memory card. And those memory cards were like 64 kilobytes. So you could save dialogue on there, some simple scripting, but you couldn't do much in the way of graphics. For the most part, had to just rely on what they had available for you. Fighter Maker was something I was maybe a little bit more excited for because you could, uh, you like build your own fighters and design your moves and everything. But the interface of using a PlayStation controller to make animations just wasn't very good. And I thought it would be like a... Like the, the wrestling games where you could make your own wrestler. But you couldn't design their graphics any, their, their appearance. You just had to rely on what was there. And you could do the moves, but the, since, like I said, the interface was so bad... Just, it was frustrating and slow, and then the, the fighting game itself wasn't very good. Fighter Maker 2? I don't know if I ever tried this one. There was an RPG Maker 2 release for the PlayStation 2 that I did pick up, but the complexity of the system was ramped up quite significantly, and by that point, I had... Um, I wasn't too interested in spending the time to learn how to do it, which is a bit of a shame because I, I thought it would have been great because the PlayStation 2 had much more memory available on its memory card, 8 megs, so you could save quite a bit more. But it was built in with 3D Engine, and that was uh, a little bit of a hindrance. They probably should have just stuck with a 2D Engine. There was an RPG Maker 3 released for the PlayStation 2, I think, which I th maybe... I, I toyed around with that one a little bit. It might have been simplified a little bit, but I still didn't spend a lot of time with it. Now you're going from John Woo to an entire animation studio. So yeah, here we go. I think this is RPG Maker 2. You're producing a game from scratch. Building a game from the ground up might seem a little overwhelming, but RPG Maker 2 helps ease you into it. So first, they, I want them to create That's Sonic. <laughs> yeah, and like look at the look at what you're playing as there. It's like a 3D environment, but it has it's so small RPG and I want them to choppy and so it, it just didn't then, feel right uh, to me. To the beginning and then select hard level, which means they can create all the things from the scratch, even the buildings. I remember I had gone and I in the original this. RPG Maker for the You're PS1, the I had done. Imagine a ball of water. Okay, the Earth. Before any. I had. Made a simple contest, game shapes, that was like five minutes long just to learn how to do it. And then I had I'd done another game called um, that was like an hour long. The game was like an hour long called Demon's Blade or something like that. Go to the programming site. Which is called event editor. Which um, I actually tried taking seriously and developing it like a proper game. And of course, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and there was only so much you could do on the PS One. So it was it was what it was. And then I decided to 
to quit being serious and I created a game called Gary's Misadventures. And this is the one I remember the most. It was some doofus named Gary just wandering around getting himself in the trouble. <laughs> I think I might actually still have the save files for that, because I never wiped the memory card. I should, um, I should try to seek that out, see if I can load that up. Gary's misadventures. You never see your army or your character, so it's like first person view for all battle sequences. But what you get to do is design where your enemies are in relation to your point of view. So is it face on, is it slightly above? And then when you throw in the special effects, if I'm attacking with magic, yeah. I get to design the special effects for do I do a fireball that launches straight out for me to you, or does it sweep around and blast? <laughs> These H Tech games are not only fun, but they're also a great way to start learning game design skills. I think it really are helps they? to understand to get into this industry what goes behind making a good game. You know the mechanics, you know the rules, but how do you make it go to the next level of greatness? You really have to get the experience. I remember somewhere. with Fighter Maker One, so by giving them just a blank slate, uh, my brother and sat down as they need, and they he spent like two hours really opens up animating a character to do a backflip. The next wave of education, interest, and just all around. And when he was done, he's like, "Look, I, I, I basically did all the work for you, and like I made a backflip." <laughs> but it's close. These games can definitely give you a taste of the world of game design. In the next part of our series, like I'd sit down with an entire, I'd sit down and like I'd populate the whole move roster of a fighter, a fighter maker, and you know, like it, it, there was some fun to that, but the satisfaction of seeing your fighter come to life is tamped down by the fact that the fighting game itself at the core was just not any good. Folks at McFarlane Toys take their role as premier makers of action figures very seriously. Founded by Spawn creator Todd McFarlane, they started with the alternative comic book hero and have blown up into a creative empire that includes figures from movies, sports, and even video games. What Todd's vision is is to take those characters out of that game and bring them to life in the real world. You can do them fairly realistically, especially if you look at the musculature. And I've never really been in the action things. figures. A lot of times we're developing the figures simultaneously uh, to where the game companies are. I have so some friends who very were, and I, I just and don't quite get it. The best that they I guess like at the time when we're having something decor decorative, you know? Have to go in and and like that thing he's making there does look paper. nice, I have to admit. In, fact, in a case like Soul Calibur, We've done that. But how, um, what does it look so like if you were to buy, like, your, your version? Because that's a lot of detail right there, and I think it's that guy carved it like that. But what's it look like when you have the mass-produced version? And how often am I going to sit down and just, like, look at this thing? No matter how nice it looks? Like, how often am I going to sit down and just look at it? But they're going to be a bit of a departure for us because we're going to make them smaller to emulate the type of product that's being made in Japan right now. Collectors might also be interested in what it takes to make a great oh, you're solid too. Oh, you Oh, snake, what happened it's to you? <laughs> artistry, realism, and the concept of remaining true to the spirit of the game. Dude, that does not look like Snake. snake from Metal Gear Solid is a good that looked like, um... We had some very good what's that doofus's name? Oh, shit. And what we wanted to do is take those characters... Seth Rogen. How do I make this <laughs> guy look kind of realistic? Solid Snake looked like Seth life, Rogen. Pull him out of the game. Guess it's like Olga. You don't want to completely abandon the feel that the game creates. Another issue Onimusha. to consider is retaining the sense of movement of a character. With the line created for Onimusha, McFarlane Toys had a high score in that department. I felt that Onimusha, we really had satisfied a lot of different design issues as far as Neck looks so how goofy. the figures were articulated and yet still maintain that ground zero pose that Todd always likes to find, the one to pose that clearly defines the character. And yet we were able to articulate it so we could get into a lot of different poses that made sense, that weren't, you know, just points of articulation, but really... I don't even mush it with one of those. Typical martial arts poses. Games, it felt like a little bit of a throwback. More than having Kung Fu grip or because it was one of those and games that had 3D character models on top of 2D backgrounds. Of, of course, in the PlayStation 2, you're going to be able to do this better. 
than you would have been able to in the PlayStation 1 with a game like Resident Evil. But when you moved into the PlayStation 2 and you saw like Resident, the Resident Evil move to like Code Veronica where it had the 3D backgrounds and the 3D characters, yet somehow still had more detail, with the characters at least, you felt like, yeah, we're moving on from that 2D background thing. Then Onimusha comes out, and they're like, no, no, no. 3D characters, 2D backgrounds, we're still doing that. But, I mean, the game was was real good, and it looked real good. Because even though we're at a more advanced generation here, you still have to worry about polygon budgets and all that kind of stuff. involved in developing and manufacturing the action figures of today, but there's no denying the made-by-hand element of yesteryear. There's a certain amount of hand Over the hell long it takes you to do this. Added at the end in terms of, you know, I've tried doing this, like, I, and I, I can't. I can't even paint the things. <laughs> so there's certain people sitting on the manufacturing line that may just be painting eyeballs all day long. If you want to design an action figure, you need to follow quite a few rules of the articulated thumb. But when you're dealing with Todd McFarlane, the rules and the molds are made to be broken. When Todd came into this industry, he'd look at him and say, well, you know, I want deeper lines in here, and I want an undercut coming around the side of the torso. And mm -hmm. people would say, well, you can't do that. And he'd say, why? So what we've worked on over the years working with Todd is looking at things and finding new ways and new materials to use in the process. So okay. Can get huh. he's looking. Whoa, look at that fella. So when you're done playing with your favorite video game, go and check out the action figure counterparts at a store near you. All right. E3 2003. E3 was such okay, a big deal. It's such a shame that it's gone, but it was sort of on a downswing anyway, because not you had like the Tokyo Game Show, and you had Gamescom, and you had Penny Arcade Expo, and that kind of stuff that sort of drew attention where everybody didn't have to go to E3 anymore. Game uh, announcements didn't have to be at E3. And it kind of lost its original meaning anyway, because these kinds of expos, this was an outcropping of the uh, Consumer Electronics Show. And the whole purpose of those was to show off your games to retailers. And the retailers were looking at like, oh, you have this coming out this year, so I'll take a supply of 100,000 copies or something or something like that, just to drum up interest from retailers. But the games press went there too, and they started reporting on it, and that's how news of game releases started getting pushed out to the gaming masses. So it sort of shifted E3 away from what it was originally supposed to be, into these big, grand uh, displays of, of um, spectacle. And game announcements started coming years and years before they would release. Like, a retailer isn't going to want to hear about Dragon Age 4 if it's not going to come out for another seven years after you announce it. So, NE3 had some, like, it started to get too big. So they tried scaling it down for a couple of years, and they made smaller E3s. And they're like, no, it's not working. So they did the big E3s again. But it was still losing... Um, losing focus because of, like, Tokyo Game Show and stuff. And then when COVID happened, they... It just... It got cancelled for that year. And cancelled for the next year. And then cancelled forever. So e is dead. Unfortunately. Space Fisherman? An import game, huh? Oh, it's a demo. Fuck, there's a demo in here. Breaking my own rules, I'm putting a demo in part two. <laughs> it's an import. So it's probably not something that would appeal to a Western audience. And not read Japanese. Sorry. Maybe I should get my phone out and let it translate. Hmm. 
在しているオーケー。Okay. <laughs> Look at this. Probably just says space fisherman, but I'm gonna. Yeah, it just says space fisherman. Let me get these, this text here. Swallow. Although it has little power, the rod is easy to handle. He is young, but well known professional space fish hunter. He is a tactician type fisherman who can easily catch any space fish with his beautiful handling rod. Okay. And this one. Come on, don't be a dick. Just translate. Average ease, use of power. 11、uh, year old. <laughs> Eight years fishing experience. He's been fishing since he was three. Learned how to fish when he's three. He's been fishing for eight years. Small size, blah, blah, blah. Other one. Health is different. The rod is difficult to handle, but powerful, blah, 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 blah. Okay, who gives a damn? I'm gonna go medium. Funny that the. I mean, Sony is a Japanese company. So is Nintendo. Sega eventually became a Japanese company, and it has been for quite a long time. Um, so, other than, as far as big,、um, big console manufacturers, like the big super successful ones, basically the only American ones have been Atari and Microsoft. So, it's a little bit,、uh, so you tend to think like, oh, You had these Japanese companies making these games that the American audience wanted, so you should probably just release everything in the United States or in Europe or wherever to maximize like, sales and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of Japanese stuff is weird, goofy shit like this that just isn't gonna sell to an American audience. Unfortunately, there are things that do appeal, that Japanese developers do, that do appeal to American audiences, and they're kind of getting pushed out of the market. Like, a big example of that was the, like, the Final Fantasy series. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> That's a series that developed、um, Japanese market, Japanese market in mind. But it always had kind of like a European fantasy setting to it. But it was definitely something intended for the Japanese market, but it appealed to a Western market. Now, as it got more popular and in, in Western markets, they sort of. Oh, I can fly. <laughs> as it got more popular in Western markets, they started putting more work into appealing to Western markets, like a lot of other. Games that are Japanese studios,、um, a lot more of them are being built with the idea of appealing to a Western market. So they're sort of losing some of that charm. Not something like this, though. This is the kind of charm I could do without. I'm about to quit. Alright, I don't know what I'm doing here. Let's, uh. Let's. Alright. Credits. And there are the credits. And I did this.
Anything else? Nope, that's it. All right, so those had two half-hour episodes. Hmm. Little bit anemic in terms of content this time around. It would have been a little bit longer if I spent more time playing those fighting games, but, you know, we'd seen half of them before. Anyway, thanks for watching.